the day is coming when your ears shall tingle and you'll hear from afar and you shall hear from near. But I will pour out of my spirit upon the earth. I will pour out. I will pour out. I will pour out. And you will not be out. You will not be left aside. You will not be set aside. For I have called you for a purpose and I have placed my hand upon you for my purpose. And I shall reveal it to you step by step as I lift you up. For the time is nearly full, says the Lord, when I shall do that which I have purposed in my heart for you. And you shall fulfill and you shall, you shall be the people that I have called by my name. You shall be the people with my seal on your forehead. You shall be the people that I have called to go forth and to be my church, to be my people, to be my body. For I have set my hand upon you and I will not forsake you. And I will not leave you, for I love you. You are mine, and I am yours. Thank you. But first, I want to read for you from 1 Corinthians. You all know the scriptures. Hopefully off by heart by now. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus... On the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken and given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you do eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I've always been intrigued about the Lord's death being proclaimed. So I did a little study, and it's a word called catangelo. It doesn't mean just to proclaim. It means to declare, to decree, to state, to preach, to teach, all these are aspects of proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And as we share the elements, we're going to do something a little different. As you hold the elements in your hands, I want you to visualize. According to the word of God, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, <laughs> think, meditate maybe, but the idea is to try and see in your spiritual understanding, in your spirit, what is taking place in the heavenly. As I just read this portion of scripture. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I look, behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom 
and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Forever and ever. And as we picture that place in the heavenlies, we bow down, Lord. We bow down and worship you. We acknowledge you as King, Lord of all, Lord. And as we partake of your body, as we drink of your blood today, we declare, proclaim, decree, and declare the, oh, the almighty power of the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us to death. He died. So, Lord, as we partake of your body and your blood today, we worship you, we adore you, Lord, but we also proclaim that you are Lord. So let us eat and partake of the Lord's body together. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Thank you. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, we've got a prayer meeting this week. If you weren't here last week, we announced that. We've changed the times of the prayer meeting. We're now having prayer meeting Tuesday mornings from 10 to 11. And I'm so grateful for those who come and prayed with me this week. It's just a lovely presence of God at the harbour. And, um, and after everybody left, I just got to stay in the presence of God and spend some time there. It's just so easy to step into the presence of God. There's been so much prayer going in at that place. So Tuesday morning, 10 to 11, if you can make it, please come and pray with us. Uh, it's just a great time to pray. We need to be people who pray, because that's where the difference is. You know, we, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but if we're going to make a difference, it's in prayer. And uh, we've got to be people of prayer, people of the Spirit. And so pe please, be people who pray and press into God and find the answers of heaven, not just for yourselves, but also for the Sunshine Coast, for our nation, for those others around the world, be people who pray. And, uh, you know, uh, Deb and I uh, have a place to live. We just don't know where it is. But we have a real assurance that God has provided. And so I would really want to thank you for those that have just prayed for us and believed with us. And so we're, we're continuing to believe and stand in faith. But I've got a very strong assurance that God has got somewhere for us. And so that's how we receive from God. We pray expecting to believe and we receive. And so that comes from God. We've got faith for it. So we thank you and agree for that. And uh, um, very, very grateful for that. Thank you for praying for Deb also, for those that prayed for Deb this week. And uh, we need to be people who bear one another's burden, right? And be people, of, be a family, a church family who walk together to bear one another's burden. You know, you're not alone. Pray this after me. I am not alone. God is with me. And so is everybody else here. We're with you. And uh, to walk together is just such a great privilege. I know in my own journey it's just been such a wonderful thing to have people support me when I couldn't support myself. I don't mean financially, but emotionally, all those sorts of things. Just to have somebody walk the journey with us, we all need it. Okay? We need it. We need one another. There's a whole bunch of one another's in the Bible. We need one another. So where was I up to? What was I saying? Wednesday night is Alpha. We called it off for the weather again this week, but it'll be on again this week. We're going to be having Alpha. Uh, young adults, uh, Sunday nights is a great time for our young people to just pray and worship and get the presence of God and pray for one another. We're so encouraged uh, with what God is doing there uh, with our, our, our young adults and keep praying and believing. For those that aren't young adults, Pray for them. Let them know that your faith is supporting and believing God for them to flourish and grow and multiply and for the goodness of God to be upon them. Pray for those that go forward and speak and evangelize and, and, and you know, are being a sharp edge. Pray for our leaders here. Pray for Georgia in the university. I asked you a couple of weeks ago, please remember to be consistent and hold them up to what they're doing there. And uh, uh, because they're on the sharp edge, you know, if you're not on the edge, you're taking up too much space. 
Isn't that what they say? <laughs> Wonderful Jesus. Kavana. Kavana is um, not Lake Kavana. <laughs> it, it actually means celebrating God's presence, which I think is just a beautiful name. And so they celebrate God's presence, which is what we're all about as a church, isn't it? So that's what the word means. That's why they're calling it that, which I think is just fantastic. I think that's all the announcements we have. Well, it's good. Coffee Connections this week. That's right. Please come and have some fellowship. It's just a good time to connect and bear one another's burdens, hear one another what's going on. I was able to share some of our things the uh, last time we gathered and we prayed, and, and that's what it's about. So, you know, don't be a stranger. Come along. It's not just having coffee. But it's about fellowship, it's about walking together on this journey. Hello? Okay. I think uh, Children's Church has already gone. We're having a good time out there. Thanks, Ellen, for taking that on this week. Okay. Let's open our Bible, shall we? In John chapter 8, we have this incredible story. John chapter 8. Spirit of God, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your word of life. Thank you, Father, that it will impart truth and transformation to us. Thank you, great Holy Spirit, for your presence in this place. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Jesus was teaching in the temple. He was inside the temple. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, this is in the temple. Now Moses, this is what they said, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Because they were trying to trap Jesus. They were envious of him and they were trying to get him to trip up. And so uh, Jesus was, was you know, the son of God with the wisdom of God and they were Jews, very strong in the law. And this is what I want to speak about today, that the law can speak so strongly to us. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin amongst, um, among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And a lot of people have made a lot of you know, assumptions about what he wrote on the ground. But look at the picture here. He said, Moses in the law, commanded such that they, she should be stoned. And Jesus, in the temple, with the stone floor, stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. And the conviction of God came upon them. And they all left one by one. And then he said to the woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they've gone. Well, I don't accuse you either. Go and sing no more. And so this picture of Moses in the law was what he was referring to because the Jews had come from this incredible experience of Moses giving them the law with such an incredible encounter with God. Moses, of course, had an incredible life. And sometimes God will do things to change a nation. And so we understand that Moses grew up in Egypt, you know, 400 years after you know, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and they, all the, the Jews, the, they weren't Jews then, but the people of Abraham had gone into Egypt and they multiplied and the Egyptians had forgotten where they'd come from, but they'd actually transformed and made the nation incredibly wealthy and put them under slavery. And when you're a slave, you do what you're told or you get punished. And they put them under slavery. So God rose, raised up a man called Moses. And the Pharaoh at the time had forgotten all those 400 years past. He said, these people, these Hebrews, are multiplying so much, let's get rid of them. So he said to the Hebrew midwives, kill all the male children. We don't want them multiplying. And the Hebrew midwives disobeyed. And they hid the children. And that's how we have the story of Moses being hidden in the bulrushes, in a river, in a little crib. And the 
the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river and heard this child crying and rescued him. So Moses ended up growing up in Pharaoh's household, the very Pharaoh who commanded that he should be put to death. And he grew up knowing the ways of Pharaoh, knowing the ways of the king. And then Moses had, you know, he knew he was a Hebrew. And he saw a couple of them, you know, fighting with one another. He killed the overseer. Moses was a murderer. And the Hebrews said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? So Moses fled into the wilderness when he was 40 years old. And, you know, he ended up meeting this fellow called Jethro, a priest of the Midianites, and married his daughter. So here was Moses in the wilderness, out the back of nowhere, knew the ways of Pharaoh, knew the ways of the king, knew he was a Hebrew, and ended up in the backside of the desert, in the wilderness. You know, you and I can sometimes feel like we're going through a wilderness. You know, things are happening. It's a dry season. I don't know if any of you felt like that sometimes. I haven't felt like that this week. It hasn't been very dry at all. You know, my, when it had a rain, my mud was getting dehydrated. We've had plenty of rain. But they were in, he was in the wilderness. And he was just going about his business, looking after the flocks as, as a shepherd. And he saw this bush burning, and the, the bush was not consumed. So he, he went over to this bush, and when he got to the bush, he, he pulled aside. But sometimes we can see the signs, but we don't pull aside. We've got to give God time in our life. And he pulled aside to look at this burning bush. And God spoke to him and said, Take off your shoes, for this is a holy place. So he took off his sandals and, and stood before God, and God began to speak to him and said, I am going to raise you up as a deliverer for your people. He always wanted to be a deliverer for his people. It was always in his heart. But this time, rather than out of his own ability when he became a murderer, this time he had the anointing of God upon him to go and deliver his people and go back to Pharaoh and to pay, tell Pharaoh to let the people go. He only asked them for three days. That was all he asked for. Three days. And then, of course, there was this great challenge. And, and Moses challenged Pharaoh. And they had the ten plagues that came. And I'm, you know, I don't want to go into all that. And that was about challenging the gods of Egypt, the ten gods of Egypt. And there was this great showdown in power. And the Egyptians, the Egyptian astrologers and magicians could, could do the same uh, miracles up to the fourth god. But after that, God just showed himself. And in the end, every firstborn child died and we have the whole Passover lamb and all this sort of stuff that came. There's this incredible story, this basis of the Israeli nation, the basis of the Hebrews came from Moses. So that's why the Jews referred to Moses, now it's speaking to Jesus. So Jesus' image, here is the picture. Jesus uh, uh, stood, stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. Now Moses had all the people out taken out of Egypt, they'd taken the spoil and the plunder of Egypt, that by the way the Hebrews had allowed them to have in the first place when they went into the, 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 the whole um, famine, that's the word I'm looking for. And if you look at these stories from the big picture rather than just focusing on the little things, you see how God works in nations. God is wanting to work in our nation. And some of the things that happen we can get distressed about, but all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. God will have his way in our nation. I'll say it again. God will have his way in our nation. God will do what he has planned and purposed to do. We're believing for it. We're going to stand and expect it. And whatever happens in the natural, God will have his way in the spirit. He will not be stopped. He will not be mocked. God will have his way. And so in the nation of Israel, he, he worked with Moses. And Moses had these incredible encounters with God. He met God at the burning bush. Then he represented God before Pharaoh and had all these plagues that came upon the Egyptians. And then when they crossed through the, the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted, 
However that happened, I don't know. But it's still a miracle. I saw a documentary the other day that saying it was probably because of an earthquake and the waters receded. Well, I think it's pretty timely of God to make an earthquake. He can do it however he wants, but it's still God. Some people say, oh, it was just a sandbank. I think it's amazing how the, the Egyptians that followed drowned on a sandbank. You know, it's like God can do it however he wants. And we can look for natural reasons, but it's still God. God does it. And so he worked in this. And all the Egyptian Israelites, the Hebrews, sorry, were following Moses into the wilderness. Then they began to complain, we've got nothing to drink. What are we going to drink? We're dying of thirst out here. What are you doing to us, Moses? We've got nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And they came to the waters of Marah, which were bitter. So God said to Moses, throw in the branch into the water, and the waters will be made sweet. This is a miracle in its own right. So when we come to the branch of the cross, it makes us sweet. It makes the water of our life sweet. And again and again, Moses had this incredible encounters with God, again and again and again. And then they said, we've got nothing to eat. We want to go back to Egypt where we had leeks and onions. And they liked this spice, didn't they? I don't know if you've ever had onion soup. I went, when I was a young pastor, sorry, when I was a young Christian, I don't even really say it, a year or so, and my pastor was a chef. And, you know, I was a university student, a whole bunch of us university students, just like you guys, you know, there's a, a bunch of us, and, you know, just all ended up pursuing God for the rest of our lives. But I just see the seeds of it just multiplying here. And, and uh, he said, we want you to all come around for dinner. I thought, wow, he's a chef. And invite us to dinner and said it's going to be better than what I get at university. And he came and he said, us all, French onion soup. And I was a strapping young man, you know. You know. I need something else later. That's all right. <laughs> How did I get on to that? Anyway, so, 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 we, so we have the, the Hebrews in the wilderness, with Moses. And God said to them, I'm going to come down and speak to you on Mount Horeb. Consecrate yourselves. Don't look at your wives, men. Consecrate yourselves. I'm going to come down. Separate yourselves for three days. I'm going to come down on the mountain. And the thick cloud of God came down upon the mountain. And the presence of God came down. And he said, don't let anybody go up on the mountain lest they be struck dead. And he gave to them and he spoke to them the Ten Commandments. And he gave it to them. And he, he took some tablets of stone. God wrote with his finger on the stone tablet the law of God. That's the image that Jesus had with a woman called an adultery writing on the stone with his finger. Because they had come to him testing him, said Moses in the law said that she should be stoned. And he wrote on the ground on the stone with his finger. That's the image. God wrote on the tablets of stone with his finger to give the law. And they were convicted by the law. The law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It speaks of righteousness, what is right before God, what is holy before God. And God gave these tablets to Moses. That was the first time. The second time, he went up onto the mountain and gave these tablets to Moses and he gave him ceremonial laws, gave him civil laws, gave him all these other laws. You know, if you do this, you'll get stoned. If you do that, you'll get stoned. If if you're caught in adultery, you'll get stoned. If you steal somebody's offering, you've got to repay. If you do this, you know, so there are all these laws that they got from Moses, which set up the foundation for our law today. And it's the law and the boundary of how we should live. And so God gave the law to Moses. He had these incredible encounters with God. The third time God spoke to Moses, sorry, the third time Moses went up the mountain to separate himself. He went up the third time, 
and said to God, show me your glory. He was Moses. He'd seen God at the burning bush. He'd beaten the Egyptians with the ten plagues. He'd seen the Red Sea parted. He'd seen the waters turn sweet at the waters of Mara. Then the next time they wanted water, he'd struck the rock with his staff and, uh, and, and brought forth water. He'd seen God provide with quail. He'd seen God provide with manna. He'd seen the, the cloud of glory and the pillar of fire by night that he met with God again and again and again. He had these incredible encounters with God, but yet he still asked. There's something about God that makes us want more. There's something about God that draws us deeper. Say, God, I want more. God, I want to know you more. I love the presence of God that comes, but we want you more. We want more, we want more. And when you get into that river flow, you want more. You want to, you just want to stay in there. And so Moses was this incredible hunger for God. He said, God, show me your glory. Even though he'd already had all these incredible encounters. God said to Moses, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'll pass by you and you, you can look at my hind parts so nobody should see my face and live. And, and so he, he passed by. God saw, he saw the goodness of God. He saw his glory. He saw his, his life. And the, the, there's something about encountering God that transforms us. And when Moses came down from the mountain, he glowed so brightly that they had to put a veil over his face so that they could look at him. The glory of God comes upon us. And when you and I spend time in the glory, you and I will glow with the goodness of God as well. Sometimes you can just tell people have been with God. They've got this glow about them. The glow comes upon them. And so when Moses, the lawgiver, had so many incredible encounters with God, incredible, again and again and again, had these encounters, and, but when the law came, there was judgment. The judgment came, and it, it was brutal. It wasn't just, you know, oh, get a slap on the wrist. No, it was brutal. A woman caught in adultery, stoned to death. You disobey and argue with Moses. God uh, said, okay, separate those who don't want to follow my leadership, you go on that side, and the others who do want to follow my leadership, go on this side. So they were separated there and the earth swallowed them up. Brutal judgment. Brutal. It's an it's a incredible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I've said this before, but when God moves in incredible power, we experience the goodness of God but also the severity of God. So we've got to be diligent and careful to closely get to God's holiness. So the law is brutal. There is judgment with the law. When Moses had gone up into the mountain with the two tablets of, and got the two tablets of stone that God wrote on with his finger, God said to him, get down the mountain because my people are falling away from me. Moses had been up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. When he came down, the people had decided to make their own God. I mean, God had done all this stuff. How stupid can people be? He'd take them through the, the, the ten plagues. They'd cross through the Red Sea. Now, oh, we haven't seen Moses for a while. Let's make our own God. We've got to be so diligent to keep our heart, to stay right before God. Because it's so easy to get pulled apart. Easy. And they made a golden calf. They said to all the women, pull off all your gold earrings and all your rings. We'll throw them into the fire. And out came this golden calf. Moses came down with the two tablets of stone written on with the finger of God with the Ten Commandments and saw what the people were doing. And in anger, he broke the stone tablet because it was a prophetic sense that the people had broken the covenant with God. They'd broken the law. They'd broken that which had God had promised. And then he, he ground up the golden calf into dust, he put it in the water and made them drink it. So this is what you want to do. You brought dishonor 
onto that golden calf. I've heard of people drinking colloidal silver. Start with the Bible. <laughs> That's the good for And he dishonoured the golden calf so there's no power in that. He brought the people's heart back towards God. God wanted to wipe them off. He said, I'm going to wipe them off. They're disobeying me. They've walked away from me. I've brought them out. I've protected them. I've brought them into the wilderness. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses interceded for them. And Thomas said to God, you promised God that you said that you would raise up a nation of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now when the other nations see that you've brought us out here and you're going to kill us all, they're going to despise you. You interceded for the people. So when God speaks to us, we've got to take a hold of what God says and remind him of his promise. And we have this magnificent verse in the Bible that says God was hinted of what he was going to do for the people. He changed his mind and said, no, I'll keep it. So Moses had this incredible encounter with God and the people that had this incredible experience with God for 40 years in the wilderness that formed this nation. And so when we come, you know, a thousand years later to Jesus, 1500 to have a long story, but they came to Jesus, they had this ingrained in them about Moses and the law. It was so strong in them because they'd had this incredible encounter with God in the wilderness that this is what we live by. We live by the law and the punishment for breaking the law is death. And there's a curse that comes when you break the law. So there's this incredible shift that Jesus had to bring to bring them out of the penalty and the judgment of the law. It's a very strong mindset. And so oftentimes, we as Christians, when we get you know, really uh, diligent and self-righteous, we can want to bring the law against others and judge them. It's so easy to judge. I knew a fellow once, a good Christian man, said to me, you know, God is going to judge our nation for the abortions and for all the stuff that happens and all the bad things. And I said, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to redeem it. It's so easy to fall into this mindset of judging according to the law, but we do not live in that covenant. And Jesus was bringing in a different covenant when he wrote on the ground with his finger, reminding him of the penalty of the law. Because if we want to live according to that, we all fail. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. We have all failed if we're going to look at the law. But the grace of God is to redeem us from the curse of the law and to redeem us from the power of the law. The strength of the law is sin. That's his strength. But see, when we come into this new covenant, there is a higher level to live at. Let's look at this verse, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put their law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbour, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. He says, I'll write a new covenant, and I'll write it on your heart. So we can have this, this level that we live by. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do something else. But the Bible says that he will write a covenant on our hearts. That's you and me. But you and I know God ourselves. We've all got to be born of the Spirit to know God as our Father individually. 
Every one of us needs an encounter with the living God. And he writes it on our heart. So when Jesus came along, there was the law that the Jews lived by, but Jesus raised the bar of those laws. Jesus said, you know, if you, if you look on a, uh, if you commit adultery, then you've sinned. But Jesus said, if you look on a woman, you've sinned. Because it's about what's in the heart. He, he, he said, you know, if you're, if you're offended by somebody, forgive. Not just once, seven times seven. Every day. So, so what happened in the Old Testament was, you know, if, if, if somebody had leprosy, you weren't allowed to touch them. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. There's a higher law. And it's like the law that was set for the, for the Jews was down here, but Jesus came and set it at a higher level, at a higher bar. Because he writes the law in our heart. He writes it here. You know, there's that verse that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But how do we pursue righteousness? See, righteousness does not come from obeying the law. Righteousness comes because it's written on our heart. And when we are born of God, we are born new. We're new creation. All things have passed away. All things are of God. We are born in righteousness. We're created in righteousness in true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24. We're created righteousness. Our natural desire is towards righteousness. Our propensity is towards righteousness because it comes out of the heart. It's not just, oh, you've done the wrong thing, you've done the wrong thing, you've done the wrong thing. If I have done the wrong thing, the blood of Jesus cleanses me in all things. If I bleed the blood of Jesus, my God, you in your wounds. I like that. So, so you know, the, the power of, of the blood can cleanse us, but we don't live out of the place of wrong desire. We live out of the place of desire towards God where the law is written on our heart. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But our desire is towards righteousness. It's towards that higher level of living. It's towards the greater thing. I mean, I'll, give, I'll give a personal example from Deb and I. That, that, you know, the law in the Old Testament about tithing. And uh, Deb and I have have chosen and purpose within ourselves. Can I share this? Yeah. yeah. We have purpose within ourselves. Because our desire is towards God, we want to give a double tie. Because our heart is towards God. So we find a way somehow or other. You know, if we're finances are right, we'll squeeze it, we'll, we'll, we'll do our 10% and we'll put another 10% on top of that. Sometimes, you know, we'll send it here and send it there. The 10% is the sowed of the church. See, when I am a slave, I will do what I'm told because I will get punished if I don't do what I'm told. That's a slavery mindset. We can be slaves to a law. I'll do what I'm told or I get punished. But if I'm a servant in the house, I'll do what I'm told, but then I'll get rewarded. So I've got to come out of slaves into servanthood. But if I'm a son of the house, I've got a heart for the house, and I don't need to be told what to do. Because I've got a desire for the house. Are you seeing this? So it, it's always out of the heart. So it, if my heart is towards it, that, that's where my finances flow. So Deb and I, you know, we've chosen. This is what we want to do. We, we want to so abundantly. We want to have our, our heart and our desire before the house. So this is, this is what we set up. Because we, we want our heart to stay in that right place. And so, so it, it's not out of the law because the law has punishment. Keeps me in a slave mind. It, and it's not even out of a servant, I'll just do what I'm told, so I might get rewarded. No, it's out of 
I've got a heart for the things of God. I want the best for the things of God, for the house of God, for the people of God. And so I'm going to give myself to that. Give what I have. I'll give it my life. I'll give it my prayer. I'll give it my passion. I'll give it my desire. If God writes the law in my heart. It's written in. And so I can express it. And when things come up that are against the law of God, that are against the principles and the purposes of God, things like offence to one, to one another, I spoke a bit about that last week, then I, I, I deal with that because I've got a greater one living within me. And if I can't do it out of my own capacity, I ask the greater one that is in me to help me. God, help me. I can't do this out of my own ability. I need you to help me so I can live out of this greater uh, place of life and grace and be a son of the mature father. Hello? And out of that place, then it flows out of my heart and spirit of God within me helps me. And I deal with all the things that come up you know, in, in disagreement with the purposes of God. And so it flows out of the spirit and in the spirit brings life. For the letter of the law kills it brings judgment, it brings punishment, but the Spirit brings life. So if I bring it out of the Spirit of God within me, the life of God can flow, and I can enjoy it, and it's fun, and enjoyable, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and I can enjoy life in here and here in the living. Does that help those know? my line dancing. Is that to be fair dancing? Fair dancing and have a caller, you know. Get up the caller, grab your partner, swing them in the round, punch them in the chin, throw them, you know, that was. That's right. Um, so, yeah, just have fun and enjoy life because of the Spirit of God that flows within us. We put a smile on our face, love God, it is written in our hearts, and it's not about punishment. So many people think about God in context of punishment. But that's not who God is. God has come to set us free. He's come to bring liberty and life and grace. One last verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 16. Let's start with verse 15. We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. The works of the law will not get us there. The works of the law will not take us into the promise. The works of the law will not fulfill all that which God wants to do in our heart. Jesus has come to fulfill the law for he hung on the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And he fulfilled the law by taking the curse of the law, by taking the punishment of the law. He fulfilled that whole thing for us. And you and I can so take that. So we can walk into the promises and the blessings and the goodness and the grace of God and allow God to be all that he is and who he wants to be in us and through us, allowing him to fill all things by his power, by his spirit. We've got a good a God. We have a good God. Mari, would you come out here, please? Come on, Mari. You gave such a powerful testimony today. I'm so grateful. Mari, would you... I'm going to ask if you've got some thing in your body that needs a touch of heaven. We're going to ask Mary with a faith to massage the blood of Jesus. And put on the hand. Yes, we'll be very diligent to be righteous in this. Stay, stay holy. But Mary, I, I, I just see this faith in you. Faith in the miracle, because this is not all about me, it's about us together, working with one another. So if you've got something in your body that needs a miracle, 
We're going to believe God together. We believe for one another. And I've never massaged in the blood of Jesus, but you have. So I'm going to ask you to help us. Could you do that? So if you've got something that you believe in God, please, come on, come out, come out. Massage in our experience. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your presence today. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your name. We thank you for your work. And we thank you for the testimony of your power working, Holy Ghost. We stand in agreement together. Your miracle power to flow. Your anointing to touch people's lives. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I'm sure there's more. Come on. Come on out. Allow, allow God to work through us tonight. Your heart of a river. Thank you, Jesus. We agree together. There it is. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you for your great power and your mighty anointing. Thank you for your work. Let it continue to flow. Let it touch one of us. Let the grace and blessing of God go with every one of you this week. I love you and appreciate you. There's still miracles flowing out here. And uh, God is just so lovely. God bless you.